Hold on to your heads and watch your step around the giant pit of dead bodies because we have the scariest horror film if you happen to have hay fever. Netflix's In the Tall Grass is a mind-bending horror film from Vincenzo Natalie based off the novella by Stephen King and Joe Hill. And in this video, we're going to be taking a deep dive into its ending and shed some light on the meaning of the Black Rock, the church, the field, the monsters, and the time loop itself. So follow me into the grass, because here we go. The ending of In the Tall Grass is actually the beginning, but this time the time loop has been broken. Whereas the beginning of the film sees Becky and Cal head into the grass, the end sees them move away from it. And that's all because of Tobin, who we'll find is the key to breaking the loop. I'll explain later, I promise. But to fully understand the ending, we must first understand the beginning, since the film, like the field, is its own loop. We start outside the church, and we end there too. This time, however, with the characters having grown through their journey. The first time Becky and Cal head into the grass, we're picking up clues as to how the field operates. Everything about it is distorted. Direction, sound, and even time itself. When we later meet Travis, Becky's ex-boyfriend, he tells Becky and Cal that they've been gone for two months, but for them, it's only been about a day. If one day in the field is two months in the real world, we can speculate this loop has repeated at least 60 times since since Becky and Cal's initial venture into the grass. This is how Travis is able to see Becky's decomposed body. He is seeing a previous loop version of her that wasn't successful at getting out. But before we get too into the mysteries of the field, it's important to know why Becky and Cal are driving through Kansas in the first place. Although you may think Becky's child is a subplot of the film, it's actually what propels the story forward. You see, Becky used to be with Travis, and then she got pregnant, which Travis didn't like. He left her, and she decided to to give the child up for adoption to a family in San Diego, hence Becky and Cal driving across the country. It's only at the end that Becky decides to keep the baby and drive back home. The tall grass has given her redemption. Travis arguably has an even stronger character arc. He put himself and his career before Becky and the child, even encouraging Becky via the A word, I can't say it or YouTube will demonetize me. Travis was a musician, just like Ross, but unlike Ross didn't give up his career to focus on a family. As Ross says, Family's everything. There's one thing I know for certain. It's that simple truth. But as Travis goes on his own journey, he sees the error of his ways, sacrificing himself so that the girl he loves and his unborn child can live. He went from wanting to, rhymes with cohort, his own child, to sacrificing himself to save it. Talk about a pretty big arc. But this whole ending would never have taken place if it weren't for Tobin. Over there, mommy. Do you hear him? He is the only character that is successfully able to break free from the tall grass in order to stop the loop from continuing. About halfway through the movie, we see Tobin beckoned into the grass by Travis. But Travis went into the grass because he saw Becky's car. And Becky was beckoned into the grass by Tobin. This is the loop. It's kind of like asking what came first, the chicken or the egg. There's no logical explanation for who entered the field first. It's stuck in this loop, bound to forever repeat itself. The film, however, does give us some interesting clues and Easter eggs. For example, the novel Becky drops before she heads into the field, the same one Travis picks up, is Jane Eyre. The story of a young woman coming into adulthood who has a child with a man she had a tumultuous relationship with. Sound familiar? But to understand Travis's sacrifice, we must first take a look at the Humboldt family and Ross's fascination with the Black Rock. The Black Rock, according to Ross, predates Native Americans. It's the geographic center of North America and was carved even before the glaciers carried the hills away. Ross even calls it the center of the center. On its surface are carved symbols, like this one with outstretched hands, which we'll see later, and of the grass people hoisting a pregnant woman. The carvings, therefore, are a prophecy of what's to come. The Black Rock also happens to be the name of the church outside the tall grass. In fact, it's called the Black Rock of the Redeemer, because every character, with perhaps the exception of Tobin, who does eventually get out, has something to redeem about themselves. But this church isn't here to worship God. It's here to worship the Black Rock. There are no Christian symbols in it, no pulpits, just a solitary locked door at the back. The closest thing you do get to a Christian symbol are these carvings of stained glass here, but even the tint of it is green, like the grass, green also symbolizing sickness. 
At the back is a solitary door which can only be opened from the inside. Tobin is able to open it after he's transported there by Travis. After Travis touched the black rock, he was given its powers, powers which according to the rock can help find a way out. By touching the black rock, Travis was able to see the different holes within the field. We get a glimpse of such a hole when Freddy the Golden Retriever moves through this hole here and winds up across from the church. It's these holes that Ross also used to catch his victims. He could always catch them because he knew where to go while they didn't. But the Black Rock corrupts, as it did to Ross, slowly taking control of its victims. Ross used to be a Christian man, so much so that he was in a gospel band, but the Black Rock corrupted him, turning his faith away from God and toward the Rock. When Becky has her child next to the Black Rock, the ground beneath it splits open, revealing hundreds of souls the Black Rock has corrupted. Their hands reach upward, almost as if pleading for help. We know countless others have been brought into the field just by looking at the different eras of cars that have collected dust in the church's parking lot. Cars from the 50s, 60s, present day, and all from different states according to the license plates. When Ross attacks Cal, we also see more decomposed bodies laying in the field. Who knows how many litter its vast expanse. Then there's also the question of the green people. That's what they're called in the end credits. They are the force behind the black rock and the people depicted on the carvings. They are different than the people beneath the rock. Their faces are made of grass and they themselves are corrupted. When Ross's eyes turn green here, it's an indicator that the green people are acting through Ross via the black rock. They can control the grass, bending it to its will, as well as move organic material, but once something is no longer living, they lose the ability to control it. As Tobin says multiple times throughout the film, The field doesn't move dead things. It makes them easier to find. The green people want flesh to fuel the grass and lure more living things into its grasp. The decomposition of dead bodies helps fertilize the land, and if the green people are to survive, they need to feed. As Ross says later on in the film, Don't worry, son. It's just flesh. And all flesh is grass. Touching the black rock gives the possessed person a window into the field's many holes and branching paths, because it will help that person track down more victims. It will help them see. Even when Ross loses all of his eyesight, he says, Eyes are deceiving around here. I'm better off without it. Director Vincenzo Natalie focuses a lot on eyes throughout the film. Here's one of the opening shots of Becky, another of a dead crow, and check out this shot when Travis touches the black rock. It looks just like the veins coming out of an eye. Eyes being deceiving is also manifested in the scene where Cal makes Becky eat her own child. Notice how the edges of the screen are blurred and how Cal magically turns into Ross. It calls into question whether what Becky is seeing happened the way we think it did, or perhaps this did happen and what we're seeing is just another unsuccessful loop. As Tobin says, This is never gonna stop. He's gonna keep killing us over and over and over again. In the final showdown, Ross tries to make his son touch the black rock, once again bringing up the theme of redemption. It's so easy, son. Redemption is so very, very easy. But didn't we already see Tobin touch the rock? How is he already not corrupted? We did, but this is a new loop, another chance for our characters to redeem themselves. In the nick of time, Becky saves Tobin by stabbing Ross with a Benny's Crab Shack necklace. We're never given too much information as to the significance of this, but it's first seen when Travis enters the grass and takes it from Becky's decomposing corpse. It seems that this item has some sort of significance to him. Perhaps it was a memento of a time he and Becky spent together living in New Hampshire. I'm assuming that's where they're from, judging by Becky's New Hampshire plates, although it's never mentioned in the film. After Travis kills Ross and touches the Black Rock, he's infused with the power of being able to see the exit, and quickly takes off with Tobin before the corruption can take over. He gives him the necklace as proof that he loves crabs. I mean, he's telling the truth about the grass. Becky and Cal decide not to go in the grass, but Becky goes one step further, deciding to go the opposite way and drop off Tobin at the police station in Topeka, as well as keeping her baby. The events that unfolded in the grass have somehow made her change her mind. Something's not right about this. We need to leave. With Tobin, Becky, and Cal no longer going into the field, the loop has been closed. But this doesn't mean more people can be swayed into its orbit. We did see all those cars outside the church, so new loops will continually spring up. 
bringing its victims in an endless cycle on the path to redemption. And a church, or at least a building that resembles one, is such a fitting physical representation of this. The Christian faith is all about finding redemption through Christ, absolving our sins through the power of God. The Black Rock takes on this role, offering redemption in a different form. One of the big flaws of this film is Cal's redemptive arc. I felt like he didn't have one, which makes it doubly unsatisfying since his character also gets out of the loop. His character really hasn't changed. The film sets up Cal's flaws being unable to let go of his sister, especially when it comes to Travis. This causes friction between the two, eventually culminating in him throwing Travis from the Bolarama. For Cal to have a satisfying arc, we need to see him him except letting his sister go, but we never saw that. Instead we see him pleading for her not to go, which ends up getting him killed. His flaw leads to his own death, but he is still rewarded at the end by getting out of the loop, something I would have changed in the second act for his character in order to make the ending more emotionally fulfilling. Overall I enjoyed In the Tall Grass, a lot more than some of the derivative horrors that have been lately coming out in theaters. It's a film that makes you think, has some gorgeous cinematography, and didn't feature any children of the corn. I hope you enjoyed this video, let me know what you thought of the movie in the comments below, and please give it a thumbs up and subscribe with the bell on to get more Think Story videos. You can also find me on Twitter at ThinkStoryYT, and until next time remember, Daddy loves you very much.